Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We will introduce our returning guest and my good friend in a moment. But uh, first, wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable Pro. For those who have not heard, you can now help support Perpetual Chess by joining Chessable Pro. You should be a member anyway. If you're a member, you get 20% discount on all courses. You can use Puzzle Connect to link to your chess.com games and review any puzzles that you miss, not that you guys are missing any tactics, but just in case. I uh, also wanted to make you aware of some some works from the Chessable catalog. Recent How to Chess guests, uh, Luciana Morales and Laura Smith, uh, both of them have courses that you might enjoy if you are a fan of our guest, Jen Chahadi. There's Queens of the Chessboard by Luciana Morales. Forcing Moves for Beginners by Laura Smith. As I've been mentioning, How to Reassess Your Chess is finally on Chessable. Judith Polgar herself has some courses, so so much stuff worth checking out on Chessable.com. And again, if you do sign up for Chessable Pro, be sure to use the link in the little description on your podcast app or on YouTube. Um, as for our guest, I think she's familiar to basically all of you. Two-time U.S. Women's Champion, award-winning author and podcaster, poker professional, commentator, writer. Her brand new book, Play Like a Champion, has just arrived here at my house in New Jersey, although secretly I already had a copy. And it's beautiful. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a beautiful book with great bios, challenging puzzles, puzzles for players of all levels. So I'm really proud of Jen, as always, as a friend, and really enjoy checking out the book. So Jen, welcome back to the pod. Thank you so much, Ben. It's so beautiful. Our books basically, um, I don't know if they're birthday twins, but they're certainly in the same month. And it's been really fun seeing your book do so well. And then, of course, releasing one just exactly a month after you so that we uh, could coincide on the new releases on Amazon for one day. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think the timing's perfect. I'm ready for people to stop <laughs> buying my book and to start <laughs> buying yours. So um, c- couldn't ask for anything more. And I do highly recommend uh, your book. I'm. It's It's something that was just really needed in the marketplace. Obviously, you wrote Play Like a Girl some years ago, and this is kind of like an extension and an update of it. But I mean, it's just... It's so much meteor and so many new players have emerged on the scene. So I really enjoy checking it out. But Jen, I wanted to start because the last time I saw you, we don't get to see each other in person all that often. But we did. I did get to attend your event at the Marshall in New York City. You're one of your probably your first, if not one of your first book signings for this book. And it was just the, the event to me had such a special feeling. Um it was for one thing there there was a gender balance there perhaps even an imbalance in favor of women but also just a real communal spirit how was that event from your perspective jen Oh, it was phenomenal. I mean, I couldn't believe some of the legends that showed up. Dr. Frank Brady, Bruce Pandolfini. I wasn't expecting Dolly Teasley. All, I think, guests on the Perpetual Pod. But I didn't know that all these people were coming. That was like the Marshall um, mailing list thing. And it was, it was a real treat. And then, of course many youngsters as well. So it was really that beautiful night where you got that cross-generational feel of chess, where um, it can reach somebody who's in their 90s and somebody who is nine. And uh, that was precious to me because for my book and also for a lot of my work um, and my passion for like chess puzzles and beautiful chess games, I think that's like one thing that we all love about chess, the ability for it to really cross gender and, um, and age, and nationality. And that night was all about that to me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, you gave a good presentation, uh, which I believe anyone can see online if they'd like. Um, But then there was plenty of time for Q&A. And it was really nice to just see so many women raise their hands and ask for advice about growing chess in the community. Um, And we actually had a question right along those lines that I'd like to dive right into, which is from uh, Dawn Lawson. So Dawn asks, she says she's planning to start a woman only chess club in my town, possibly a mix of in person and virtual. And she asks if you have any suggestions that might help that effort succeed. 
Well, I first of all, I love the question and the way that it's phrased because I think um, in the question you have part of your answer, which is yes, do online and live because one of the things about starting women's and girls chess clubs, which I I learned from all my work um, at US Chess Women, is that you really want to have an online component because the raw number of women playing and girls playing is lower in a lot of geographical areas, and so in order to get a critical mass. You want to get that online identity also. Uh, and then you can kind of like also add some live components as well. So that is a really good starting point. Although, you know, I guess if, you, if you're doing an online version, there might realistically be some people that can't make it to the live events. And I think that's okay. You can kind of do a mix of both. And um, other than that, I think it's all about finding the right timing and scheduling and doing a lot of polling to figure out like what times are actually going to work for people. As we know, women oftentimes have even busier schedules than anyone because of um, the you know elder care, child care. So we really have to kind of keep an eye on what's going to work for them if we want to have successful chess clubs. Okay. And hopefully this doesn't happen, but if it were to happen where Dawn starts to have it and there isn't a lot of interest initially. Um, do you have any any advice for what, what someone in that scenario might do? You could try, like, try to pivot to making it like um, some kind of uh, d- dual gender for some of the events. I noticed some some places are doing that as well. So uh, it could be women and men some nights and only women on other nights. And I think that could kind of grow it. And as it's growing, you can try to get the men and the women there to invite more women. And eventually, maybe you can do some all women's nights. So I think that's totally fine, too. And I actually would love to see more creative projects like that. I think there are more and more women's and girls events all over the world, and I love to see it. But I think kind of battle of the sexes type tournaments or like um, mixed double tournaments, I think those are are really um, interesting as well. And I, I, we do see more of that kind of thing as well. But it, it's, it's quite I think it's there's room for that to grow as well. Yeah, I like the mixed doubles format. And Jen, obviously, you've got a lot of experience in the poker realm as well. And it seems to me like there's more like ladies night type stuff in the poker arena. Why do you think that is? Oh, yeah, it's really blowing up lately. I mean, there is this organization Poker Power, which I'm an advisor for, which is trying to get a million women into poker. So they're kind of pouring a lot of resources into that, like especially corporate women teaching them how to play poker because it models like good financial lessons in life, which I completely agree with. And then on top of that, there's just a lot of interest in women in poker. And there have been for many years. It just kind of feels like it's reaching a boiling point where all of the operators are interested in this market of women who want to get better at the game. And it's, it's tough because I think compared to men in poker, women don't have the, the wealth. So there's a wealth gap. And there's also an education gap in that I, almost every guy that I talk to, especially in chess, which, you know, maybe not might not be that surprising to you, but certainly in finance and chess, like they learn poker at some point in their college days. They got invited to like a poker game. There are women who literally don't know the rules, right? It's much rarer for that to be true for a guy. And so you're starting out with less money and less knowledge and it makes it a little harder to just like jump in. So it's great that they're filling that in. And I'm wondering if you're going with like, what can chess learn from that? Right. (laughs) Good question. You're too good. You got too much experience (laughs) (laughs) running your own podcast. So (laughs) I'll just leave the room, Jen, and you can just interview (laughs) yourself. Um, No, but let's hear the answer. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, what can chess learn from that? You know, the hard thing about chess and and women is that girls are very interested in chess, like extremely interested, but there is still this confidence gap in women. So um, a lot of women think that they could be good at poker because they're really good with like life skills or reading people, but they think that chess is like, is, is really too hard if you don't learn when you're young. Right. So there's that, that confidence gap, which, you know, understandably, like they're, they're correct about some things that it is like a language or music and it is a lot easier if you learn when you're like young. So it's like based on like a, a half truth. But I think that it often stops women from really taking it more seriously. And that's a shame because we would love to have more women in the game. And I think that there's really a lot that chess can give to people. 
Yeah, that was actually one of the quotes I highlighted from your book. You you spotlight a young woman named Nadia Ortiz, and she she's been a big advocate for um, you know uh, boosting awareness about mental health in chess. And you write. Um, in chess, losing and even blundering hurts, but it's part of the game. So you're talking about how you shouldn't let it drive you aw- away. And you say, being too hard on yourself may not just make you unhappy. It could drive you away from chess itself. Avoid negative self-talk traps like, quote, I'm just bad at these types of positions. So do you, so you, would you feel that you've observed that more, that sort of self-talk more from women than men? Oh, absolutely. And I will say that I do notice it from both genders. I think it's almost like a humor device. But sometimes I think if you say things too many times, they can become like not a joke anymore. Right. So I I, I do think it's very dangerous. And, you know, the great chess coach Elizabeth Spiegel um, has been very vocal about this when she talks to groups of girls or I'm, I'm sure she talks about this to all kids. But I've seen her speak to girls about it that like you can't say I'm bad or I'm yeah. terrible at this type of position that you just have to remove it from your vocabulary because it can get in the way of your confidence. Um, And so I think it's a really important point. And of course, you're going to enjoy things less if you're not confident. And I I feel pretty strongly about that. Yeah. It's something also, I recently did a study with um, professors on NYU about checking gender balance. And we also saw um, the results of this study were published quite recently um, in the fall of 2023. And one of the findings was that um, coaches and mentors underestimate the potential of their female students and that that effect is exacerbated. And I think this is the interesting part. It's exacerbated when they think that in order to become a great chess player, it's really important to be inherently brilliant. Like the kind of idea that you have to be a genius to be a good chess player. If you have those beliefs, then you underestimate girls more, which is pretty interesting, which I guess just goes to show that it's really important to um, value everyone's potential, even if you don't see the immediate spark. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it when I was running a lot of scholastic classes. I could see the boys raising their hands a lot more often. And obviously that can become sort of like a uh, vicious cycle. And now I see it as a dad, as I've mentioned on the pod before, neither of my kids much to my dismay, have shown that much interest in chess. But my daughter, who's a bit younger, my son wasn't lacking for confidence, whereas my daughter does have a tendency, a strain towards some of the negative self-talk you mentioned, even though she's not even really like pursuing the game as much as I I might like. Yeah, yeah, that's... um... Yeah, that's something we really need to to work against. And I think like just... um modeling um good behavior ourselves i think is really important and continuing to like call on female students when they're there and again like i feel like the important thing about observing these things is it is true they can happen with both genders my own son you know the other day um he he hadn't really been playing on lee chess before but he was he was doing like a group lesson actually with sean martinez so it's nice. like, shout out to Sean. <laughs> yeah, because my brother and I used to teach Sean back in the day at 318 here and there. Anyway, so Sean, Sean met Fabi at one of the nationals and Fabi instantly liked him because he's such a tough love, but charming as well, which are great, great qualities for a coach. Reminds me of my, my old coach. I am Victor Frias. Definitely. You could say that he was both charming and had tough love. Right? <laughs> great combination. So yeah, we signed up and, we, and the tournaments were in Lee Chess. And so I mentioned, oh, Lee Chess is great. You know, Magnus Carlsen even plays here sometimes. All the greatest players in the, um, in the world play here because he'd been used to playing on Chess Kid. And then the next day, when we tried to get him to play Lee Chess, just like a practice game, he was like, no, there are grandmasters. All the, all the <laughs> are grandmasters. That's funny. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I want to play Chess Kid. I don't want to play a grandmaster right away. So how did you react as a parent? Did you then let him switch or did you try to talk him out of it? Well, I, I explained to him that the that all 100,000 people playing on, I don't know how many people they get at once. What is it? You know, right. of, they're not all grandmasters. Right. And then he's not going to get paired with them. Although, I'm, I, I mean, there's a lot of people who would just love that. I mean, like they would pay for that. Right. So, right. Yeah, it's, it, it is something we uh, we discussed a little bit and he ended up playing on. I think it's good for kids to play on all the different sites, actually, because um, speaking of confidence, we all know that online blitz is a bit streaky. So if you have like a losing streak on one site, you, you hop to another site, right? So makes sense for kids. 
Yeah, for sure. And on the topic of confidence, Jen, at the Marshall presentation, you told the story. And of course, since we went to the same uh, middle school and high school, I was there for this. And and remember when you just took off like a meteor after some years of maybe spinning your wheels and, you know, being in and out of chess a bit. Um, so what do you think happened for you that gave you that confidence where suddenly you realized that you could stop the negative self-talk and that you actually did have the ability to improve a lot of chess? Yeah, I think it was a couple things. You know, I mean, probably a lot of it was puzzles. I really do think a huge part of it was puzzles, doing chess puzzle books and like just kind of losing myself and um, getting many in a row right and just like spending hours looking at a chess puzzle book and seeing um, the combinations click. And then definitely some really great games that I played against people who are higher rated than me and um, all night blitz sessions where I started to beat people who were 2200, which I didn't think was possible before. But even like you beat them once or twice and blitz over the board and like you get this vibe like I can do it. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of puzzles, there's a new book out, Play Like a Champion, that has has a, a bunch of them. Um, and I would say it's it's impressive. So how did you think about curating the level of the puzzles, Jen? Because I was impressed that you, you start with something as basic as maybe explaining what an x-ray is and introduce some of your own terminology, as, as we'll get to. Um, but then, obviously, you're highlighting the play of these amazing players. So some of the combinations get pretty uh, deep. So how did you balance that? Yeah, you know, one of my inspirations was Puzzle Rush because I, I saw a lot of great players play Puzzle Rush in the last few years. It actually dropped when I was doing an event in St. Louis. And like, I think that was like 2018 fall, maybe. And so everybody was playing it obsessively. And it was just like interesting to me because I was like, wow, everybody doesn't mind solving these like, you know, dozens of like easier positions for grandmasters. They're like, they're like enjoying it, you know, they're clicking through them. And so, it, and then of course it gets to something that's really hard. Right. And you know, the, the weaker players can't solve that. They, you know, their score is, is halted or they they get three strikes and the grandmasters just keep going. Right. So I, it occurred to me that I feel like you can in, entertain people with really easy positions and really hard ones that they belong in the same book. Especially nowadays that people are not only using books for their training, right? They're also using online tools. And so the the book could be something for your library that you can kind of use for your whole chess life, right? Yeah. So if you're new and you can only solve the first few chapters or the first like couple pages of each chapter, then you can put it on your shelf until you're ready for the harder positions. And if you are so strong that the easy ones will be easy for you, you can still enjoy like just looking at them real quick and seeing who the players are which is a nice thing about this book that um, a lot of famous players, all women players who, you know, you might um, be a fan of, but not have seen that many of their games, you're going to see their names pop up. Right. So most of the top streamers are in this book. Um, and that includes like the Botas sisters and Dina and Nemo, but also um, some that people might not have heard of and will get to know a little more. And of course, world champions and top U.S. players. So it's kind of fun and entertaining just to kind of like flip through and just see their names, even if it's a maiden one or a maiden two. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I mean, so much of the book, I mean, to me, a big part of it is just like, it's, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to, to see all the people's stories. And as you say, you can sort of grow up with it sort of in the mold of like Silman's, um, Silman's Complete Endgame course, where it's like a wide range of ratings that you buy once and then can return to many times over the years. Exactly. Exactly. That was, that's a, that's a great analogy. And another thing that was important to me in this book is like, I always felt when I was growing up, a lot of the tactics that I did, and even when I do Puzzle Rush and tactics online, I feel like there's not as many pawn promotion tactics as there could be sometimes. And, uh, and I think that as an E4 player, maybe I sometimes felt a little bit behind because I always think of it as like D4 players who play like the white side of the King's Indian and the Grunfeld and they get like a pawn on D7 <laughs> or a pawn on C7 and they find some beautiful tactic to, to clean their pawn, right? And I, I felt like, you know, my tactics in that area are not as good because I don't get those positions and I maybe didn't train them as much. So I have a couple of chapters that are like all devoted to that, like specifically, um, one's on pawn promotion, one's on liquidation. And yeah, that's something that kind of interests me that uh, there's all these beautiful end game tactics that are usually in, in end game books, but they can also really be in tactics books. 
Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm a fan of pawn promotion puzzles in particular. Yeah, and Jen, I had actually highlighted your quote from, um, I think it was a liquidation chapter where you said, liquidate rhymes with calculate, because um, both as a teacher and a player, I've certainly noticed the, the, the heightened importance of transitioning to king and pawn endgames. Oh, gosh, yeah, I mean... I have some nightmares about that. In fact, the first Grandmaster Scalp I was supposed to make um, in the Castle Chess Camp against Bisquire, I was winning and I uh, was, so, was so excited and I transposed into a pawning game and I was going to queen first and yeah, I missed, I missed something and it ended up being a draw. I feel like we, we all have those nightmare stories of, yeah. of basically transitioning too quickly into the pawning game and only making a draw. So yeah, it's important. And you know, the funny thing about that chapter, those chapters on pawn promotion in the book is many years ago, I wrote an article about how there was a study that showed that, that women players, that female players solve pawn promotion tactics more easily because they think of promoting the pawn as like childbirth. Huh. And whereas like checkmating is like hunting and killing. And well, when do you think that article was published? Uh, I, I give up. <laughs> it was, it was April 1st. <laughs> oh, okay. Ages ago, ages ago. That flew right over my head. Sorry, Jen. I'm a little dense. <laughs> well, it was, it was, I mean, it was a bit of a subtle April Fool's joke. I mean, like I, that's my theory on, on April Fool's jokes, you know, like you have, to, you have to get some people to believe it. Otherwise it's like, you're going for like 10 to 15%. <laughs> It's funny because as you were saying it, I was thinking that doesn't sound right to me. That doesn't ring true. But I wasn't thinking like that's false. You know. That, that you... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, who knows? The funny thing is, was so long ago. I think it was like literally, maybe it was like 12, 13 years ago. You know, it, it, it yeah, it's it, nowadays the amount that we can actually study what type of tactics people are better at and like who, um, you know, you can always go into like your profiles on chess.com, right? And see like which puzzles you're missing. Um, I find that really interesting. And, and that's actually another thing I noticed in this book. Like when I picked a player for a theme, I was kind of shocked that sometimes it was like I, without it being a coincidence, it seemed like that person kept like, coming up in that theme. Uh -huh. I mean, maybe, maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe it was just like, I was primed to look for like skewers by, you know, Sarah Kadim because I assigned her to that chapter, but it felt like, no, this keeps popping up. And one example would be like Alexandra Botez. She's the discovered attack chapter. Right. And I, right. you know, she doesn't have that many games in the database because she is, you know, she's played for a couple of Canadian Olympiads and many world youth championships. But then, of course, a lot of it is like from her streaming career. But of those like hundreds of games, there are many great discovered attack problems. And I was like, this is so interesting. Is this a coincidence? Is this all in my head or is this like a real thing that she's just like really good at setting up and finding discover attacks? Right. Uh, yeah, and I was wondering about how you curated the puzzles. So I figured there were some database queries involved, as you've just um, discussed. But did you ever like go to the source and ask them for sp specific positions? Yes, yeah, sometimes. And some of them had given like lectures, like to my girls chess club at US Chess back and back when I was working there. And um, so they had already like showed me a couple of their favorite games, or some of them I just asked like, "What's your favorite game?" And in some cases, I just looked up their their games or saw some of their YouTube videos where they talked about their favorite games. So all sorts of ways. But usually, I would find one really great, beautiful gem that I wanted to actually walk through, and then I would like make them like the topic of that chapter. Once I found like the beautiful game from a player, I would make them the theme of the chapter, and then oftentimes they would pop up multiple times in the chapter playing that theme. In your case, Ben, can you think of like a tactic in your career that you feel like you're shooting above your rate that it kind of recurs more than you would expect it to? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I used to feel like I had a decent number of Greek gifts. Unfortunately, I lost all my games from like up till I was 18. Um, so I can't verify this. It's just my word. But I did feel like um, back in my s sacrificial days, um, I did. That would be my guess. Yeah, in my case, I felt like it was pins. Okay, I felt like I like I often had a lot of good pin, pins and positions because oh. I cause I look at some of my favorite games and I was like, oh, like there is one against Chow, um, and then there was one against Maria Kovotsu at the the World Youth, and I was like, oh, look. just like going through some of my faves, I feel like that was a tactic that kind of recurred. 
But it's, huh. it's kind of nice to think about that from like a positive point of view, because I think we're all, oftentimes people are thinking about like, what do I miss all the time? Right. Yeah, it's true. It's about like what people are doing right. Yeah. Got to got to accentuate the positive. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to highlight from the book, Jen, is you, you introduced some new terms. Like I was a big fan of the term zap. Um, could you uh, explain the the derivation of the new chess term zap? Oh, yeah. Well, I feel like there's this hierarchy of forcing moves, right? So you've got checks, captures, and threats. But to me, like a checkmate threat, I'm not sure that it should be like number three. That's like right. so important, right? It shouldn't be just like put in with all the other threats like queen and rook and like just like moving your pawn and attacking a piece like a checkmate threat is huge it's almost as big as a check you have to be able to see those very quickly and that's one thing um that my son has been doing really well like anytime he can threaten checkmate he does it that's great <laughs> even if it's a terrible move but i think it's it's a good starting point because it's like that is that's a really important skill um because a lot of these moves don't involve a capture or a threat i mean they don't involve a capture or a check so you have to kind of have them in that like bucket of a move that you must look at because otherwise you're going to miss some some important wins. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, as, as a fellow poker player, our mutual friend, Donnie Ariel, who also has some experience teaching kids, used to always talk about like if you're if you're watching uh, if you're watching your students games and one of them threatens checkmate, you would say it's like a massive equity swing because like there's always <laughs> such, so there's like at least a 20 percent chance the other kid's not going to see it. Exactly, exactly. And that's the thing, like Fabian right now, he, every time he can threaten and checkmate, he doesn't, even if it like loses a piece or something. But some of the time he's totally lost and he threatens checkmate and the kid doesn't see it. And I'm like, how did you win that game? <laughs> that right. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're losing, it's a very, it's a very good, good skill to teach your kids slash students. When you're losing, try to try to threaten checkmate somehow. Um, now, so as for the term zap itself, was that just sort of trial and error? How did you come up with it? Yes, because I wanted something that was strong and one syllable. Because that's yes, my great. That, that's my thing with checkmate threat. I mean, that's three. So that's very wordy. Yeah. Like, you know, check and capture. Yeah, I gotta I gotta get it down to one syllable so that uh, kids and well, grown ups and it, everyone, you know, that's everybody needs to see a zap. Yeah, and <laughs> one other chess advice snippet I highlighted from this was. You were talking about how we all make blunders and you need to forgive yourself uh, for making blunders. But you mentioned, and this is something I've observed as well, um, that often it's not that you miss something due to the depth, but you miss like you just miss a move entirely early in a sequence. And you refer to it as uh, thinking sideways, which, if I'm not mistaken, is also the title of your next book. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And uh, yeah, speaking of, of it. it it's yeah, I think that it's something that, you know, the greatest players in the world have also talked about. I, I heard Magnus Carlson talking about it on the Lex Friedman podcast and um, Anna Musichuk in your book um, talked about it as well, that it's so much about the breadth yeah. rather than thinking far ahead. And really, the issue is that it's like long think, wrong think. If you keep looking down the line, a lot of times you're missing something side to side. Right. Uh, and I think that uh, that's just a hugely important concept. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so I know that this book is front and center right now, but are you working on your next one yet? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely working kind of like in tandem because my other my other uh, my the book I'm working on right now, Thinking Sideways, is more of a literary nonfiction and creative nonfiction. So it requires a completely different mental headspace as play like a champion, which was a really fun book to write, Play Like a Champion, because there were all sorts of like different levels of tasks. Like some of it was like collecting positions, analyzing positions, writing prose. I mean, I got to tell you, this is not going to be my last chess book because it's so fun. So no matter like what kind of mood you're in, you can like work on some part of it. Um, Thinking Sideways is an incredibly challenging book because um, I, I find that there's not as wide of a diversity of tasks. Like it requires like really a lot of like, it's either prose writing or research. And um, it's, I'm starting to get on a roll with it. Um, but I'm very grateful that I had this uh, play like a champion um, book to kind of like, uh, you know, get me in the constant daily practice of writing. 
kind of a good yeah. warm up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it is well written. And one other thing I wanted to highlight for listeners um, is the explanations are very good. I know a lot of people get frustrated when they get puzzle books and then the answers are just moves. So especially as you are, when you're when you're trying to reach um, a wide audience of uh, chess levels, it's it's really helpful to actually have the moves explained when you present the answers. And I'm sure that uh, writing those was uh, was pleasant as well. Oh, yeah, that was that was hard because, you know, it came at the end because we had to like number all the positions. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I can do the solutions in a week and like three weeks later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, like, oh, I want to try to explain things and you miss something. And yeah, but it, it's uh, it, it was it was a great pleasure and allowed me to kind of like go into some depth. Um, to some of the positions, like where either the source or the players involved or the site. And yeah, I, I, there's another book that does that really well that I enjoyed. And I, I was partly inspired by that Perfector Chess mm-hmm. um, by uh, Volit, Volitkin. Vol- Volikin, yeah. yeah. Volikin. And then there's a co-author as well, I believe. Yeah. yeah. But um, that's, that's a really nice book too. It's more advanced though. I think it's pretty advanced, probably... I don't know. I think the first person I saw reading it was like Irina Crush. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd say it's a mas- master level book for sure. Um, like when Peter Giannato has talked about the push he made from 2100 to 2400, that was the book that he highlighted. Um, and similar, yeah, I would not tackle that if you're below 2000, but it is a, uh, it is um, great challenging material. Um, and on the topic of writing, Jen, so we're recording this on December 20th. I've been like deep in a Jeremy Stillman rabbit hole. The pods haven't come out yet, but they will have um, by the time our interview comes out. And you were quoted in Tarje Svensson's um, uh, wonderful obituary of I Am Stillman. And obviously, I've talked to you a bit about him over the years. Um, could you uh, let our listeners know what, what your relationship with this uh, legendary author was like and what you learned from him? Yeah, I'll never forget the first time I really talked in depth to Jeremy Silman was after the 2004 U.S. Championship, I believe. It was the one that I I didn't, um, I, I did really well. I earned an IM norm. I had some wonderful games. Um, and at the time, women and men were actually in the same section in the U.S. Championship. And the idea was the top female scorer would become the U.S. women's champion, kind of similar to like Gibraltar, where they have like a very big women's prize for the person who does the best from the Swiss. Um, and in this event, uh, I did fantastic, but unfortunately, I lost my last game. Um, it was actually a, a really well-played psychological game by Ben Feingold in that he played the English against me. <laughs> 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 that, that's it. Yep. Once before, it's done. <laughs> and, um, yeah, like, obviously, obviously a, a great guy. Um, and, you know, I, I lost that game. And I did not win the U.S. Women's Championship, but I did tie for first. I tied for first with Irina Crush and Anna Han, and we played a rapid playoff. And uh, I, I think I played very terribly. I don't remember, but I don't think I won a game. I think it was like Irina and Anna both beat me, and then it was like how they did against each other. And Anna actually ended up winning, which was a huge upset, of course, because Irina was already like 2,400 plus. So I was very gloomy, to say the least. <laughs> I was super gloomy because I'd had this great tournament and then I just like, just uh, collapsed, right? Uh, Rapid was never really my forte. um, And, you know, so it wasn't really that surprising, but I was still sad. And I saw Jeremy at the closing party and he came up to me and he was like, you know, I really liked your articles that I I read from you in chess magazines. I believe it was new in chess and chess life magazine. Um, Have you ever considered writing a book? And I was at NYU at the time and studying literature. So I was like, absolutely. That sounds like a great idea. So this conversation, you know, at the time ended up changing my life, really. And what's funny about looking at that time is I didn't realize how big of a compliment it was, to be honest. Right. I, I didn't really... I, I wasn't aware of what a great writer Silman was. I mean, I knew of his reputation, but I didn't actually read his books myself, I don't think. I mean, maybe I flipped through them, but they weren't part of my childhood library. So then in, in retrospect, when I started reading some of his work, you know, both in chess and outside of chess, I was like, damn, that was a real good compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've had a similar experience because as I tell I am John Donaldson and have a few times, I was an accelerated dragon player as a kid. So I had their book on the accelerated dragon, Silman and Donaldson, but that's not like, you know, that's not prose. That's 
opening lines. And that was a very high quality book. But both you and I, Jen, are of a generation where like how to reassess your chess and the amateur's mind, like they didn't really hit until we were already sort of master level players. So it's only later that uh, that I realized he's just full stop an amazing writer, like, you know, irrespective of chess. So I agree that it's a high compliment. And to to sort of tie the bow on the story you were telling for listeners who aren't familiar. So Jen's first book, Chess Bitch, then subsequently was published by uh, Jeremy and his wife's publishing house. It's called Soman James, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And then what was it like? Like, who did you work with when you were actually writing the book as a young woman? Um, mostly his wife, Gwen, but um, I talked to Jeremy all the time and he was just so, um, so inspirational because he really really valued kind of the creative arts around chess, like the ability to travel the world because of chess and, of course, writing in chess. So I feel like in a lot of ways he was way ahead of his time because, of course, many people now are trying to make their livings from like content and travel and kind of like, you know, the lifestyle of chess, right? Um, and the, the passion for the game and really describing it in an artful way. Um, he also wrote um, another one of my favorite books about Paul Benko. I mean, it's a huge book. Do you have that one? I have it. I haven't read it. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's a book that you can kind of flip through because I think uh, the, the last half of it or the last third of it is also Benko's chess problems with mates and twos and mates and threes. And yeah, it's really a beautiful book. So he he really, I, I, think, I feel like that publishing company, really, a lot of it was also a labor of love. I mean, I'm sure they made money from the books. In fact, there was a New York Times obituary, which kind of went into detail about how much each book sold for. But it's one of those things that you often find in life. Like they made money because they didn't care about the money. Right. <laughs> they made money because they wanted to make the book the absolute best they could. And then people realized how good it was and they sold like hundreds of thousands of copies. So it's like forgetting about the rating, forgetting about the money actually makes you end up getting more rating or getting more money in the long run, right? Yeah, it's funny. You're highlighting a few of the same points that came up in my interview with Donaldson, and obviously it hasn't come out, so you haven't heard it yet. Um, And just for anyone who didn't catch that interview, I would also mention um, that by the time you hear this, I will have posted a couple old interviews with Jeremy Soman uh, that Fred Wilson of Fred Wilson Books in New York City did. So those are going to be on the Perpetual Chess YouTube channel only. Um, so if you, and they're audio only, they're a bit grainy, but, uh, I'm going to post them on YouTube. So be sure to check them out if you want to hear, because his sort of, as Jen alludes to his sort of unique, uh, insights into addressing a marketplace and writing in a sort of, uh, conversational and, um, understandable style, like it all comes across in the interview. Um, and Jen, I had another topic on another question on the topic of writing. So you've written by my count, two posts for Substack in about four months. You know, you you didn't make a blog page, but obviously you've been super busy. But do you have any any plans of writing more in sort of a blogging format? Or are you too busy with your your book? Well, I do think I I'm going to do um, a little bit more. I'm not sure I would do uh, weekly, um, but I, I think uh, the last the last month. So my first post was my resignation letter for U.S. Jazz. And then I finished up Play Like a Champion like the month or two after that. And then in the last couple of weeks, I've written like a blog. Uh, the last like month, I've written on the blog every week or two. So I feel like that's a nice pace. A lot of times it's a way to kind of like go into more depth about something that I wrote about or talked about elsewhere. And in particular, like if I have a video, um, yeah, I think it's really nice to have a kind of like written accompanying it to that because sometimes people don't really like to watch videos and they just want to see the positions that you show in them and like walk through them. So I think that's kind of a format that I will probably continue with. Okay. And actually, Substack lets you just upload the entire video there, which I think is a really nice perk as well. Yeah, the the interface is quite nice. And for any listeners who are not sub, just search the words Jennifer Shahadi and Substack and you'll find it. Um, and I'll, I'll link to it as well. Now, Jen, so you've mentioned, of course, leaving U.S. chess, obviously, for a chess and U.S. fan like myself, that that was sad. Um, how, how has life been for you with the, with this extra free time? Wow. Well, you know, it's been a very emotional process, of course. I mean, just the amount of like, you know, anger over this whole ordeal and sadness, you know, first, obviously first, you know, super angry at Alejandro for everything that he did, which of course, much more came out once the, uh, once I tweeted in in February and then once the uh, Wall Street Journal article came out in March, 
Um, for anybody who did miss that, it's pretty easy to find online. It's titled How Sexual Assault Allegations Against a U.S. Chess Grandmaster Went Unaddressed for Years. Uh, and it interviewed um, eight women who alleged um, assault and harassment um, from Alejandro Ramirez, including three who were at the time were under 18. So, yeah, that uh, that kind of whistleblowing experience was, you know, both very tough and also very gratifying at the same time. You know, I'll start with the bad part. I mean, I ended up paying like a very heavy price in blowing the whistle. I mean, ultimately facing such hostility, I didn't feel any reasonable choice except this step down from the roles that I worked on for so long. And I mean, it was obviously particularly painful and ironic to have to step away from U.S. chess women since kind of the whole point of this was to make the chess world safer and better for girls and women. And really the once I found out, you know, how bad it was, the world at large, right? Um, so, I mean, obviously, in the end, I'm, most, most people listening to this might know at least the basics of the story, but just in case they didn't, in the end, at least we were, you know, successful in forcing change. Not only did Alejandro resign from the club and the U.S. Chess Federation when the Wall Street Journal article dropped, but he was also ultimately banned from both institutions. And beyond that, it really seemed like it kind of ignited a like global reckoning, I think, of Me Too and Chess. Yeah, which was long overdue. And and I appreciate your talking about it. I know it's, it's got to be difficult, as I've you know said before, and my heart goes out to, to you and, and all the other victims. It's um such a depressing story and, and depressing that that it ended up that you, that you felt like you had no choice um, to to leave to leave U.S. Chess, and obviously there's some financial sacrifice. Um, you know, have to find new health care stuff like that. Like it's just sucks all around. Um, is there any bright side? Like, <laughs> have you found yourself with more time to work on other endeavors uh, in the subsequent months, Jen? Well, I guess the biggest bright side is just like the feeling of pride that I really do believe that the world will get better as a result of my actions, you know, I mean, like, I think you're already seeing a lot of things happening. Like, first of all, the number of survivors who came to um, me to talk to me about what happened to them and ended up talking to the Wall Street Journal and to other bodies in some cases, uh, you know, I'm really grateful that they, they did that. And I also noticed the, um, of course, the open letter from the women in, in France, um, Yoshi Iglesias, among many others, um, which got like kind of incredible worldwide attention, right? And it, it's it's created some concrete things, right? I mean, the German Federation, the French Federation, even FIDE are announcing like new partnerships with Safe Sport or in the French and German Federation, completely new policies. Um, I think uh, it, it's really something that I, I'm, I'm very, very proud of. You know, it's like not something I understood at all. I don't think until you're a whistleblower, you can really understand it. It's just yeah. incredibly lonely in certain ways, partly because you know, you're going to lose friends. I, I didn't lose you, so right. <laughs> I didn't expect that. But you do lose people that just like work friends and things like that. You know, you lose relationships because there's people on the other side of it, basically. There are not even people that you're necessarily bad, like that just, you know, decided they wanted to keep their job you know I, right. I, I i don't think people can always take up the um every single battle or you know i don't think people can always take up every single battle and sometimes fighting institutionally and from within is important and you can't really see everything that's going into that but uh you know financial and friendships that i lost were were really tough but the bright side is this, this feeling of, of proud and hopefully it'll be easier for the next people the next women, and not only women, as unfortunately you and I know, um, one prominent case that did precede this and was, you know, at our at our own uh, high school where there were allegations of the chess coach there, uh, which um, came out in the Philadelphia Inquirer like five years ago, something like that, five about five years ago, and and that involved boys. So I think that's something that it's also really important not to lose sight of that. This is not just about women. It's also about men and boys. And then in many cases, it's actually men and boys who are very um, reluctant to come forward because if the perpetrator is a male, um, then if they're not homosexual themselves, they might feel like some stigma or shame. And so I, I, I do like to make that clear that this is about making the world safer for women and men, boys and girls, everyone. 
And I think that we've made like some really big strides towards that. And you even saw some direct consequences of this institutionally. I mean, it took a long time, but the St. Louis Chess Club did apologize and they announced a whole slew of um, proposed changes, including therapy for victims and survivors. So that, that was a very welcome sight to see. And um, you also saw U.S. Chess Federation recently, um, the um, executive rec- director announced that um, she's stepping down and taking on a new role. And so I think there is actually an open job position right now for executive right. director of chess. So people who are listening. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any chance you, you would? I saw someone online asking, how about Jen, you take that job? I'm guessing that that's unlikely. <laughs> oh, I definitely would not apply for that right now because I still feel that even I feel like there's still like a lot of. Um, I don't know, I still feel like there's a lot of hostility against me. I mean, they mm-hmm. did, a, they did a, you know. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, if, I feel like th- that would not be a job for me right now. Not, not at this moment now, but I can imagine in the future taking on a kind of like um, leadership role in chess because there is, um, I think a little, what this did expose is that with the chess boom, and I think I saw something that Levy Rosman posted or tweeted about this that really resonated with me that there's been so much growth in chess over the last few years, but do we have as much leadership that understands the chess world and the mechanics of it that have risen to the occasion? I think we're a little bit behind in that area. And I'm hoping like in the next decade, we can kind of catch up because there's so much potential. I mean, we've seen how much chess.com has grown, right? But I think there's that kind of potential at us chess. And at other, maybe potential other organizations, other nonprofits, there's huge growth potential. And many of these organizations are growing. But I think like the sky is the limit, really, because of what you see, the interest in chess. Yeah. I, the educational yeah. purposes of it. So, yeah, it's that I think there is that leadership gap that we need to fill in the next uh, decades. Yeah, well said, because I do feel like there's all, there's specifically often a, like Just.com is doing a great job promoting, especially the online game. But there there can be a disconnect where people get interested in pursuing in-person chess and maybe the experience that they have um, is not one that wants makes them like want to come back. You know, like I just think um, possibly more more like local leagues and local bar nights and stuff like that. Um, could could continue to help the game. And I know Levy himself, the aforementioned Levy, like in that uh, great New York Times profile of him, he mentioned something he'd mentioned before, like his, he calls them like far-flung ideas of sort of like launching like Levy Rosman chess clubs, but uh, stuff like that could be a lot of fun, whoever it is that launches them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's Peter, who I think you mentioned earlier, um, and the uh, Alto tournaments, which yeah. I heard- I heard the Marshall Chess Club is going to do some of those as well. I mean, I think that's just fantastic. Yeah, actually, the day that I did a book talk at the Marshall, they had done one of their first, I think it was one of their first adult tournaments. Yeah, and by by all accounts, it was a huge success and people really enjoyed it. Um, so, Jen, so in wrapping up, you've got this fantastic new book out that everyone should buy. By the way, when we really say goodbye in a few minutes, I'm going to be giving away a signed copy of Jen's book. So be sure to uh, to stay tuned for that. You're hunkering down, trying to, you know, going through the phases of procrastination, trying to work on your your other book. Um, what about poker Like and other book events? Like what else do you have on your calendar uh, starting January 2nd when this will come out? Oh, great. Yeah. Well, I'm actually working, I'm doing a few events. I, I, I love the um, Impact Coaching Network in um, New York. Um, they're also associated with this nonprofit, The Gift of Chess, which is fantastic. And they have these camps that my son goes to. So now <laughs> often to get free camp tuition, I show up and do a little right. event. <laughs> right. So I'll, I'll be doing that. Uh, I love the kids there are fantastic. And they, you know, Russell, who's in, um, who's the, uh, I don't know if I want to call him the ED or the CEO because the organization, one's a nonprofit and one's a for-profit. But anyway, the man in charge, he's great. And he does uh, a lot of like really great media around his events. You know, you're always hearing these great stories about like the lives of the kids and the lives of chess players. So I'm really excited about doing that. We're going to be doing some events there. And then I also am going to be going to the Chess Kid National Festival. Oh, yeah, that looks fun. Yeah, super psyched about that. I mean, again, that's that's something which I think 
is really great. Just creative ideas in the live chat space, you know, trying ideas that, you know, get kids or get grownups to play live chess. Everybody wants to play live chess, but maybe there's a little twist on it that can make it more um, enduring or that can fill a, a gap in the marketplace. Like um, this event that um, Mike Klein is headlining. Well, actually, Gotham Chess is headlining. Well, for my son, you know, he's still only six. So Mike right. Klein the Gotham chess for the six year olds. Okay. Fun master Mike. He is just like, he has all, he's captured all the, uh, the four to eight year olds hearts. That's for sure. Yeah. And I'll be there. Mike Klein, Gotham chess, uh, James Canty, Danya. It's a really star studded lineup. Oh, Danny Ranchai. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, we're, we're going to be doing all sorts of like fun events in addition to the kids playing to win a national chess championship. So that's going to be a blast. That's like on president's day weekend in February. Yep, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, sounds sounds amazing. And then ASAP Philly has this Checkmate Violence event, which I'm quite psyched about. So it's like a marathon chess event. They like start one day, and then the kids like have a slumber party and play chess all night until the next <laughs> night day. And it's like a it's a fundraiser and a chess tournament to kind of like highlight um, the importance of after school programs to keeping kids like occupied and safe. And yeah, it's going to be a beautiful event as well. So yeah, I, I love doing events with kids. I'm never really going to stop that. And then, um, of course, yes, I'm not, I'm going to write thinking sideways. and I'm not going to write another book in between writing it. <laughs> right. I think I have like lifelong membership into the procrastination club for procrastinating, writing one book by writing another book. Right. <laughs> That's like amazing. You can't be that. Right? <laughs> yeah. But I, I can imagine that. Yeah. As you allude to a puzzle book is uh, less daunting than just all those words. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and the other thing about the puzzle book was that it was written in a, such a stressful time for me because this 2023 has been so marked by the Alejandro Ramirez ordeal, the whistleblowing and all of the investigations that follow. And, um, you know, it's been, I've been so grateful for all the people who've come to me for advice, who have, you know, confided in me, but it's also been emotionally exhausting. So, yes, working on like a chess puzzle book after like hours and hours of that during the day has been like just kind of like a nice escape. Um, but I think I'm ready. I'm ready for the next chapter or the next book. And yeah, I, I do want to thank everyone who's in the community, even though like institutionally, I felt like very betrayed. I really felt like the community came through in such a beautiful way. So I did want to close by thanking that. I mean, from you to, you know, everyone at chess.com and Lee Chess, um, obviously our, my brother and, and your great friend, Greg, it's, it's just been incredible to people, to see people, um, men and women really step up to kind of like move forward chess into you know, the next, the next phase that it needs to be where everybody is safe and everybody's included. Yeah. Well said, Jen. Well, I mean, you, you, you took the hardest step and obviously it's, it's made a big difference, but I know it's been a tough year. So really appreciate you joining me to discuss it. And you're writing this great book, Jen, is it time for me to give this away or do yes, we have a, let's do okay. It. <laughs> so I've got some detailed instructions that I'm going to go through. Um, but basically, so first of all, unfortunately I can only give a physical, I can only ship a physical copy in the United States. I'm sorry. I, I've been shipping a lot of books with my book and it's just, it's expensive to ship to Europe and it gets lost 25% of the time. So that's, that's a bad combination. So what I'm going to do is anyone worldwide can enter but I only have a signed copy within the United States. So anyone outside of the U.S., I'll, I'll send you a forward chess copy. Um, so I'll be doing two winners. And anyone inside the U.S., I have a, an inscribed copy from Jen. Now to enter, all you really need to do is email ben at perpetualchesspod.com. Um, but it would be nice if you send a screenshot of either a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or a screenshot of your subbing to the Perpetual Chess or Jen's YouTube channel or the Perpetual Chess or uh, Jen's Substack, aka blog. So basically, some sort of uh, engagement would be nice. But secretly, if you just send an email with the subject line uh, book contest, you are entered. Um, so, and uh, all the instructions will be in the show note, uh, in the show notes, and anything I forgot as well. And the winner will be determined on January 16th. So on January 16th, I will send an email to whoever won. Uh, I may, by the way, and I won't necessarily respond to your entry when I get it, 
but excited to give out this beautiful signed copy. Um, and again, we'll also give out a digital copy to someone outside of the United States. How did I do, Jen? Do you think I forgot like 50 details? No, that's amazing. And you're giving out a digital copy, a beautiful forward chest, I take it. Yeah, yeah. It's a great book for forward chess. It's a great format for it. So um, by the way, we didn't get we didn't get to talk about it, Ben, but I actually just bought your book on forward chess because which is the highest compliment to a book. I only have the hard copy and the online book for books I really love. But oh. I misplaced the hard copy and I wanted to reread your sections on calculation and, and whatnot, so I'd be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna quiz you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate that. <laughs> it looks um, great on forward chess. It really does. It's great. I was yeah, yeah. The Kindle and forward chess because they're, but I was like, oh, forward chess has been great. I mean, and you know, like Kindle, a lot of it would go to Jeff Bezos, right? So he's got plenty of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, yeah. And of course, play like a champion, as you said, also uh, great for forward chess. Um, so Jen, great to catch up. Good luck with the book launch. I'm sure it's going to crush. Uh, I'm excited for you to take over and maintain, maintain that uh, number one new chess book releases spot for as long as they let you uh, have it. Thank you so much, Fred. It's been a blast as always. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs>